All right, good morning. Thank you very much for the introduction and for the opportunity to, uh, to present today. Um, I will be talking about how we can use predictive algorithms in uh, the design of ALS clinical trials. So there, there are various purposes and various uses of, of, of predictive models for, uh, for trials. And um, I will highlight only one, but in the end I will mention also the, uh, the other purposes. So the rationale for uh, this work is, is mainly driven by the urgent uh, unmet medical need for, for patients living with ALS. So these patients have a very uh, poor prognosis with a median survival of only 18 months uh, after the diagnosis. Uh, some patients have a much shorter survival than that, and, and some other patients have, have much longer than that. And the key issue, at least for, for patients in Europe, is that there are no uh, effective treatments available. And um, the good news is, is that there's a lot of uh, trials going on. So this is a, uh, a readout from the clinicaltrials.gov uh, registry. Um, with all the uh, phase one, two, and three trials that have been registered there. And what you can see is that there's like a clearly an increasing trend uh, over time. And um, uh, I think if we update its uh, table to, to last year and, and to this year, I think we can see even a larger number of clinical trials that's being conducted. So it's a very active field, so that's very hopeful. Um, but the, the issue remains is that the success rate of clinical trials in, in ALS remains extremely low. And the, the main reason for this is that the disease is very uh, heterogeneous. So there's very much variability between uh, patients. So I've here shown two uh, key outcomes that, that we use often in clinical trials. So on the left hand um, is the, uh, the survival time of patients. So this is the survival uh, from the existence of first symptoms up till, up till death. And uh, well, we, we can distinguish a few subtypes of, of ALS, but, but all of these uh, patients fall under, under ALS. And what you can see is that the, the average or the median survival is, is quite poor, but, but some patients have a much shorter survival than, than the median and others, even if you have like the worst subtype of ALS, so in this case, the bulbar onset, so onset in, in the mouth region, you can see that there's still some patients that, that are surviving over 100 or sometimes even 200 or up to almost 300 months uh, after the onset of their symptoms. And related to that is another outcome that, that we have. So that's the functional progression rate. So the ALS after ZAR. So this is a, uh, a questionnaire um, that, that assesses the, the daily function of, of patients. So it asks about the patient's ability uh, to speak, for example, or to, to walk or to like uh, breathe independently. And if a patient doesn't have any symptoms, then the ALSFSR total score is 48. And with complete loss of all uh, daily activities and daily function, uh, the score decreases to, to zero. And what we have here on the x-axis is, is like the, the months since diagnosis. So what we can appreciate here is that there's uh, uh, some patients that have no progression at all. So these patients remain relatively stable. So during two years or 24 months, um, but on average, the, the pattern is, is declining. So representative of the progressive nature of, of ALS. But there are also patients that are declining very rapidly. And, and these patients that, that show here a very rapid decline are, are probably the patients that have the event here first on, on the left hand. And these patients with no decline at all are probably the patients that have a very long survival. Now, the, the problem related to this is that it makes it very difficult to, to measure treatment effects. So if we have a treatment effect that's similar to, to uh, antibiotics, so, so here we have a very large treatment effect. So if we can simply measure like the uh, biological activity of, of ALS, and then we give a drug and within minutes, and we can measure that there's like a, a change in this biological activity, uh, then it would be very easy, I think. But, but in ALS, unfortunately, um, these treatment effects are very unlikely. And I don't think it's, it's not only for ALS, but for any uh, neurodegenerative disease. So, so we're looking at very small treatment effects. And often these effects are happening in a delayed fashion. So it's not that we can observe it that we uh, immediately after we give a drug, now we have to wait a couple of months until the treatment effect uh, is going to show something. Um, and that's 
even further complicated that we rely on, on clinical outcomes. So unlike oncology, uh, where we can just measure like tumor volume, for example, or tumor spread. Uh, here we have to rely on, on clinical outcomes. So the LSFSR that I showed on the previous slide or uh, survival. Um, and th that makes it very complicated and challenging of, of how we can detect treatment effects. So uh, what we would like to do is that we can reduce the variability between patients. And if we have a very homogeneous group of patients, um, you can imagine that it much, becomes much easier to detect a, a treatment uh, response. Um, so, and that's, that's the main aim of, of uh, inclusion criteria or eligibility criteria for clinical trials. So we would like to select those patients that are most likely to respond to therapy, but also to create a subgroup of patients that is relatively homogeneous so that we have a higher chance to detect a treatment effect if one exists. So what we often try to achieve there is to exclude patients that are very rapidly progressing because these patients are simply too fast uh, declining um, and the treatment, effect, the treatment doesn't have time enough to, to have like a biological impact. Uh, but also patients that are already at in the end stage of, of ALS because their damage is already so severe. Uh, there's actually uh, not much that we can delay still. Um, and then other important category is the exclusion of very slow progressing patients because these are the patients that cause all the uh, variability and makes it very complicated to measure treatment effects in clinical trials because you can imagine that if a patient doesn't decline during 12 or maybe 18 or 24 months, uh, we are also not able to detect whether a drug um, uh, delays the, the disease progression rate. So what we need to know is what actually defines then this progression rate. So can we define a few characteristics of uh, a patient? And then if we know those characteristics, then we can uh, start to select patients on that. And there's uh, a lot of literature out there of what, what, what those characteristics of patients are and, and how can we define what's a slow progressor, what's a, a fast progressor. So this is a relatively old study from 2015 from an Italian group, and uh, they looked at different uh, variables that are related to the progression rate as defined by the ALS FSR. So that's on the previous slides, that I, the one that I mentioned. Um, and you can see that there's various factors related to them. And, and these are all on the multivariate model. So these are all independent from each other. So you need to know multiple factors actually to, to define the progression rate. So if we want to uh, have efficient inclusion criteria and we want to reach these targets or these aims that we have, we need to somehow select patients uh, in a multivariable way. So meaning on, on multiple patient characteristics. So how we classically do that is that we have several layers of inclusion criteria for a trial. So this is just an example. Um, so we have age, so only patients that are younger than 75 years old can participate in our trial or patients with a uh, forced vital capacity, so a lung function measurement of at least 60% can be participating because the vital capacity says something about the stage of the disease and probably also something about the progression rate. Um, and the same go goes for ALS, so uh, for age, so for patients that are older are unlikely to, to survive for a very uh, long time. So what do we have now is two example patients. So we have one patient that's 76 uh, years old and just is excluded based on this age limitation, but the, the vital capacity, so the lung function is actually quite, quite good. Um, and we have a second patient that has, is just two years younger than patient one um, and has a, a poorer lung function, but he falls within these criteria. And if you can imagine that which patient is most likely to complete the study, it's probably patient one and not patient two. So we're in this way of selecting patients, so by using like group-wise or list-wise inclusion criteria, we're actually selecting the, the wrong patient in this case. Um, so what I would like to, uh, to challenge today is that this is not a multivariable way of selecting patients, but actually there's a univariable way of selecting patients. So every patient needs to uh, fulfill a univarial, uh, varied uh, inclusion criteria. Now we 
looked at how effective are these criteria in clinical trials. So what we did in the past is we did a systematic review of all clinical trials. We extracted from these clinical trials the in and exclusion criteria, and those in and exclusion criteria we then applied to a uh, population-based cohort of all consecutive diagnosed patients in uh, the Netherlands in this case um, and we evaluated so how many patients at the moment of diagnosis can actually fulfill the in an exclusion criteria and could thus be participating in um, a study and and this is the result so this is only from the cohort of 2010-2017 um, and what the, every dot here means like the exclu exclusion rate so for this trial so the, the below one if we apply these criteria to the population based cohort about 20 percent of the patients will be excluded so 80 percent of the patient couldn't participate in that study but if we go to the the higher one uh, and i hope my video is not covering it but you can see that uh, for the 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 upper trial uh, about 90 to 95 percent of the patients are being excluded so only five percent of your population can participate so if we do like a uh, uh, meta-analysis over all of these trial results, we can see that we have about like a, a pooled exclusion rate of about 60%. So 40% of the patients at the moment of diagnosis can only participate in clinical trials. So this is a very large exclusion rate. Um, and one may wonder how generalizable are our results that we're getting from clinical trials in this case. But there's another uh, more important aspect. So what happens to the variability? So if we apply like the average in an exclusion criteria to our data set, and this is the same figure again that I showed before. So with the ALSFSR and like the variability. So if you remove here all patients that did not feel, fulfill like the average in an exclusion criteria, we actually end up with this figure. So now we have removed 60% of the population. So 40% remains. Um, and this is the variability that we would have in our theoretical clinical trial. So what you can directly see is that the patient that was slow progressing well, he or she is still in that population. The patient who is fast progressing, he or she is still in that population. Um, and that relates to the example that I gave before. So by using like these list-wise univariate inclusion criteria, we're actually not selecting the right patients and we're just needlessly excluding patients uh, and preventing them from for clinical trial participation. So... What we need to do is to think of, can we more look at the patient as a whole? So we have like these criteria that are important that define the progression rate. So if we combine all of those criteria together um, and look at the patient as a whole, so more on an individualized approach. So maybe we can then better um, make a selection of patients. And, and this is what we use the prediction model for. So it was quite long. Uh, introduction, uh, but I will start to talk about the prediction model that we uh, that we used in this trial. So how we the way how we can do that is is by using like a regression framework. So it's a very simple framework. So it's just like a linear regression. So we have criteria one. So this could be H, and we have criteria two that could be vital capacity. And in each of these criteria, we give a certain weight. So what we then do is we take the sum of those criteria and then we got like an inclusion score. So a patient that has a good score on criteria one, but a little bit poorer score at, at criteria two can still maybe have a good inclusion score. And uh, then we just for the trial, we decide, OK, if a patient meets a certain inclusion score, well, then he or she can participate in the study. So what we did for the regression framework in this case is that we used and developed a uh, prediction model. So the, the model that predicts survival time in ALS patients. So we developed that in a very large uh, cohort of European patients. So uh, over 11,000 patients actually participated in, in uh, 14 um, population-based data sets. And uh, what we do is we predict the, the survival time of patients. So here in the in the dashed line are like uh, the uh, the observed survival time uh, among these eleven thousand patients, and then in the the solid line there are like the predicted uh, survival times, and especially for like the the um, the lower four risk categories, let's say, uh, we can see that we actually predict quite well, like the observed and the uh, the observed survival time. Uh, but for like the um, 
a longer surviving patient, the model was a little bit off. But for uh, overall, the model was doing a quite good job. So with a uh, uh, area under the curve or like a C statistic of about 0 0.8. And you can see that it's relatively consistent about like the different cohorts that, that we have. So this model we're going to use to make like these weighted in an exclusion criteria. Um, so this is how the formula looks like. So it's based on like eight different patient factors. So we have like final capacity, we have something about the diagnostic delay of a patient, about like the pre-diagnostic progression rate, so the delta FRS, we have the ages in there, like the side of symptom onset, how sure are we about the diagnosis, other symptoms, so frontal temporal dementia, um, and genetic factors. So what we can do now is that we can make for every patient, we can make a risk profile. And then based on that risk profile, uh, we can try to, to select a patient for the clinical trial. So if you do that for the entire population, what you can imagine is that you get like some kind of a distribution uh, where um, um, the people, some people will be here on the right hand tail, and that hopefully those patients will be reflecting the fast progressing patients, and other people are here on the left hand tail, and hopefully those patients will be reflecting the slow progressing patients. Um, and if we do this in an actual clinical trial, then we get these kind of uh, results. So this is a uh, just similar interpretation as a histogram. So we have a population-based uh, cohort that's here in, in gray. So that's the actual uh, distribution of this risk profile among all our patients. And then I have illustrated the distribution in different clinical trials. Um, and what you can see is that there's a clear shift to the left. So patients with a better prognosis are overrepresented in clinical trials. And this is something uh, that we know. Um, so actually, if we think back about our aims of our inclusion criteria, so we want to remove the slow progressing patients because we cannot measure treatment effect, but we actually are doing the, uh, uh, the reverse in our clinical trials. We're over-representing these patients. Uh, so that, that is something uh, of, of importance, I think, to note. It. Now, what the idea now is, is that we're going to relate this risk profile with the progression rate. So we can just simply uh, do that in, in old clinical trial data. So uh, yeah, in every trial, we basically see the same. So with every unit increase in our risk profile, so based on the prediction model, we can see that the progression rate in the ALSFSR is increasing or decreasing. So that gives us a little bit confidence that we can say, well, if you're in this end of the spectrum, you probably end up there. And if you're in this end of the spectrum, you probably end up there. And the idea now is very simple, is that we can say, okay, we can just make like a kind of boundary selection uh, for, um, for the risk profile. And then hopefully we, by doing that, we can reduce the variability. And by reducing the variability, we increase the precision of our clinical trial and our ability uh, to measure treatment responses. Um, but the, the first question, of course, is so how are we going to define these boundaries? So what we what we did in this study is, is that we looked at like different combinations. And in fact, we looked at over 2,500 different combinations of like an upper and a lower boundary. So we can set it a little bit to the left or a little bit to the right. Um, and then for every combination, we calculated like how many patients could include. So if we would like put them all the way till the end of the distribution, all patients can participate. If we put them all the way together, no one in the end would participate. So we need to be making a shift there. And this is simply reflecting those different levels of the in an exclusion uh, rates of, of the population. So what we did subsequently is that we took the, the number of patients that's eligible for every um, uh, uh, yeah, uh, um, eligibility criterion and evaluated how much uh, that impacted the sample size of our predicted clinical trial. So if uh, we use no in an exclusion criteria, all patients would be eligible and compared to like an unselected data set, we would have no benefit uh, in terms of sample size or in terms of precision. So what I have here now, I have for every gray dot, that's like a combination of like the 
the risk profile in an exclusion criteria. Uh, so we can calculate now, for example, for this dot here, we can see that uh, if we would set this boundary, about 60% of the patients would eligible, but our sample size would increase by about 10%. So actually we're doing a worse job than no selecting, uh, using uh, no in exclusion criteria. Um, and what you can see now is that we can define like some kind of an optimum. So this is like the, the, uh, the ideal boundary of your uh, risk profile eligibility window compared to like the maximum sample size reduction that you can uh, achieve with your clinical trial. And those are those black dots here. Um, and the orange dots are the actual clinical trial. So those are from the review that I showed before. So for every trial, we can also calculate how many patients would be eligible for that and how did that impact the theoretical sample size reduction. So if we look at, at this trial here all the way down, we can see they excluded about 80% of the population and they achieved a sample size reduction of about 2%. So that is not very a good sign. And these, this trial, for example, here actually increased the sample, sample size uh, that they required. Um, but you can see that overall the trials are doing a Okay, job. So you can see that that the Idaravon study here, that's the uh, that's a treatment that has been approved in the U.S. Um, you can see that they resulted in the largest sample size reduction, but at a, quite a high price by excluding ninety percent of the population. So that makes the conduct of the trial extremely difficult. And what I would like to highlight with this picture is that if you would have used the risk scores or more uh, efficient way of selecting patients, you could reach the same level of sample size reduction, so about a 30% reduction, but with a much higher proportion of the patients that's going to be eligible. So in this in this case, it's in about a five-fold, four to five-fold increase in the eligibility rate. So there's a much more efficient way of, of selecting patients with, in the end, you can also create a very homogeneous population. Now, this way of selecting is, is quite new, uh, but it could also be beneficial for, for many other rare diseases, I think, because they, they encounter the same kind of problems, uh, especially with the heterogeneity. So we discussed this with the, the EMA uh, two years ago now, and in principle, they endorsed this approach, mainly because you have the potential to include a larger part of the population. So it makes the, the results of your trial much more generalizable. Um, and the inclusion criteria that you use better select, predict prognosis and also be better uh, representation of the progression rate and maybe also of drop, dropout. Um, but what they did require us to do is to also register like the occurrence of intercurrent events. So how does it change in your background therapy or like the use of a concomitant medication affects the prediction performance, but also to look at the external validation of the model outside of the EU. So we're busy now with collecting data in the US and in Australia and, and in Asia to, uh, uh, to be, uh, to, uh, externally validate the model. And then if we have collected these data, we uh, the idea is to go for like a qualification procedure of, of this way of selecting patients. So the um, what we're doing now is that we are uh, using the model in actual clinical trials. So as the prediction is quite complicated itself. So what we have developed is like some uh, software tool that can be used just in the clinic. Uh, so at the moment that we see the patient, we can just put in the, the numbers. So like the date of the screening, the date of birth, and then diagnostic information and the information about the uh, disease. And then based on uh, on those uh, on, on those data, the the tool will give you like the the risk profile of a patient, and then also shows you like the eligibility window where the patient should have have been. So in this case, the patient is not eligible because he falls outside of this eligibility window. Um, and uh, what we what we have in the tool then is that that it creates like a, a automatic report, and in that report it just says whether the patient is eligible or not eligible, and that that can then be stored like in the in the ECRF or just in the CRF uh, at the at the site. Um, so yeah, we've developed also like a standard operating procedure. So how do you define the in an exclusion criteria? So there's a lot of implementation work. Uh, 
has gone on uh, going on in the last uh, two years for this um, and we had to write like a standard operating procedure also about like how do you communicate the outcomes to the patient so you need do we need to say something about the prognosis or why a patient is excluded so we did a study with the patients um, to, to see what is the is the best way so a summary um, the main challenge for, for clinical trials in ALS, I think, is the heterogeneity between patients, so especially like the clinical heterogeneity, because we rely on, on clinical outcomes to say something about the treatment effect. And I think that predictive algorithms can really help to reduce the variability uh, between patients and, and to make the, the clinical trial population much more homogeneous and, and as such increase like your precision or reduce your, your uh, required sample size, which I think has, has great value for other uh, rare diseases as well. Uh, other uses of the prediction model that I didn't talk today about, but, but which you are also using in, in clinical trials is like to, to use these predictive models as risk stratification, uh, but also to assess like the balance after randomization. So it, is the prognosis of the patients equally balanced uh, after randomization? Uh, and that's much more efficient way of looking at, at the randomization balance rather than looking at every variable individually. Um, and as you can imagine, because the the risk profile is such a high predictor for for the outcome. Um, it's also an important uh, covariate in the uh, in the statistical analysis plans that we're doing. Uh, but we also use the model to predict like interim analysis. So when do we expect a certain number of events to happen during the trial, or when do we expect to have sufficient information to to say something about about survival, for example? So we can use that model also to predict the operational aspects of the clinical trial. And the last part that this is getting more and more interested is to use these models as a virtual control um, that I think needs more uh, more research. So thank you very much for uh, for listening. And uh, unfortunately, I will not be uh, around in person for for the questions. But uh, if there are any questions, I'm I'm uh, happy to answer those over email. Thank you very much.